As you may know, we moved into a new apartment recently, which has caused me to have a few thoughts on the design of modern kitchens. So in this video, I thought I'd share with you a little bit of my architectural expertise in sharing the top 10 kitchen design mistakes and how to avoid them. When it comes to maximizing space in a kitchen, compared to cabinets, drawers are just so much more functional as you can so easily access everything at the back of them. I mean, can you just imagine how hard it would be for me to get my hand to the back of that space if that was a cupboard? But unfortunately, some people still don't like specifying them for a number of reasons. Let me explain. Now, as you can see, what we have here is a nice clean cabinet door front. Now, if we were to instead put drawers here, it would firstly be a lot more expensive because you're going to have multiple smaller drawer fronts attached to essentially a bunch of boxes, which are the drawers themselves, which also need to be installed on several runners, which significantly increases the cost. And on top of this, it's also going to look worse because you're going to have a bunch of gaps in between each of those drawer fronts too which if you're going for a very clean and minimal looking kitchen, isn't really something that you're going to want as it does make the space look significantly more busy. Personally, I think drawers are absolutely worth the increased cost as they just make your life so much easier and they're not just for your knives and forks, but they're also great for heavier items like plates and saucepans and even a lot of your pantry items too. But what I've come to really dislike are concealed drawers like these ones. Now, I get that it's quite cool that these are pretty much invisible. The one thing that is incredibly irritating about drawers like this, especially in this kitchen, is that these are the only ones at a reasonable height for us to store our knives and forks in. So every time I wanna get myself a knife and fork, I have to first open a door, only then can I get to the drawer to get what I want, grab the fork, put it on the counter, close the drawer, and then close the door again. Which, as you can imagine, considering how many times you want to get an iPhone fork during the middle of the day, gets pretty annoying. This may not be quite so bad with concealed drawers inside deeper actual drawers, but when you put a concealed drawer inside a cabinet with a door, you can't open the drawer unless the door is fully opened, which often means that you end up bumping the door like that, which isn't really the best for your drawer, or your door. So my groundbreaking recommendation would be to just use normal drawers in the first place instead of these silly designers always trying to put form over function. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay, I'm done. Push close fixtures. Now, these are essentially door opening devices which work on a spring mechanism, not all that dissimilar from a ballpoint pen which essentially means you push on the door, it pops out, and it gives you somewhere for your hand to open the door. Now, these can be great if you're after a nice, clean, minimalist look, or if you're a bit like me and trying to hide the fact that you're a bit of a rubbish minimalist to begin with anyway. And they can even work out to be cheaper than buying doors with handles, which have a whole host of problems attached to them anyway, which we'll get into later in this video. Despite being all for a nice, clean and contemporary kitchen, there is a big reason why I think that these kinds of fixtures are a little bit rubbish. Because if you really think about how you usually use a cupboard door, you open it up and then you swing it closed. But with this ingenious invention, I can't do that, which is incredibly frustrating. And as you can see behind me, having a nice, clean, minimalist, handleless kitchen doesn't really look all that great if all the doors are continually left ajar. And this isn't really helped by the fact that they're absolute fingerprint magnets too. And it only occurred to me the other day, what happens if one of these fails? I think if all of the cupboards in this kitchen were to be designed with push close latches and paired with a glossy finish on all of the doors, it might actually have been enough for me to completely write off the idea of renting out this apartment in the first place. But thankfully for the most part, this kitchen is actually designed relatively well with some considerably good finishes. As you can still get the same look, as for top cabinets, you don't actually need push close fixtures because you can just slot your fingers underneath them. And even though they generally cost a little bit more than plain cabinet doors, you can buy doors with a rebated finger pull, which gives you the same clean handleless look without the annoyance of a cupboard that doesn't close properly. Now, 
Now, in most contemporary kitchens, the most common way of lighting them is using spotlights, because these do a far better job of evenly distributing the light across the kitchen when compared to a single light source. And on top of this, some spotlights even allow you to angle them in the direction that you want them. Now, I can't even be mad at this one, as this is a mistake that I've also made myself, as when you think about it, it makes the most sense to put the spotlights right in the middle of the galley and right over the top of your island, as this is the way that is most effective in evenly distributing the light across the room. Or so you'd think. The main problem with this, which I'll now illustrate, is that you actually want to be lighting the work surfaces that you're working on top of. So in this case, the island is lit great. However, when you move over to the countertop on this side, my nice big fat seven and three eighths size head is casting a massive shadow, which isn't really ideal when you're trying to julienne some carrots. Now, us architects love everything to be perfectly aligned and centered. So really, if it's more important to you that your spotlights are nice and aligned in the center of your kitchen so that they look better when they're off, that's up to you. And actually, you can somewhat go about this and fix it by fitting some under cabinet task lighting. Didn't mean to do that. But as I was saying, this is a great way to mitigate the fact that my big head is casting a nice fat shadow over this countertop, as now the countertop is a lot brighter. And I just wish that whoever designed this kitchen chose to put this light switch along with the others, as there is no point in time that I'm ever going to want to have these lights on without these ones on. So if you're designing a new kitchen or your existing kitchen doesn't have the best of lighting, my advice would be to just install under cabinet lighting wherever you can as it also makes your kitchen look a lot nicer too by layering the lighting. Okay, here's another one. At this point, I'm feeling quite bad and I'm really hoping that whoever designed this kitchen doesn't watch my videos. I'm also starting to realize that I look a little bit stupid as firstly, for some reason, I decided to put on a jumper that matches the exact color of our cabinets. And secondly, a lot of these mistakes are mistakes that I made myself when designing a kitchen for my mum. But anyway, this next one is also about doors. Now you'd be right in assuming that buying one large door is cheaper than buying two smaller doors, as whoever's making these things only needs to finish one edge here rather than finishing an extra two in the middle. Also, if they come pre-drilled for hinges, that saves them drilling another set of holes on the back too. But as you can see while I'm making this demonstration, it isn't really ideal that this cabinet door is right at head height. So if for instance, I'm doing something where I need to put several things away at once, like unloading the dishwasher, moving from here to here becomes a little bit of an obstacle. Not to mention when there's two of you using the same kitchen at the same time, you may get in trouble for accidentally pulling a door out and smacking someone's head. Not that I'm speaking from experience or anything. Now, I completely get why someone would decide to put a door matching the width of the cabinet that they're installing it onto, as really, this does just make sense. However, as we just saw, this can become incredibly irritating to use over time. So my genuine recommendation would be, if you're using wide cabinets, always pick doors which are half the width of them, as this might save your marriage. But unfortunately, if you've already installed cabinets this wide, this can be quite a costly, but not impossible mistake to fix. Next up, let's talk appliances. Now, in our apartment, we're lucky enough to have an integrated fridge freezer. Actually, we're lucky enough to have now two integrated fridge freezers. But my lifestyle inflation is beside the point right now. When it comes to appliances, you actually have two types. You have integrated or standalone appliances. Now, these here are integrated appliances because they are built inside of an existing tool cabinet and then they have cabinet fronts placed in front of them. So they're pretty much invisible unless you know where to look for them. Now, the benefits are quite obvious in the sense that they are a lot more pleasant to look at as they're a lot less in your face. However, if you were to put these in somewhere like a commercial kitchen, they might not make the most sense as they're a lot more difficult to install. There's multiple components, meaning that they're probably a lot easier to break too. And when it comes to replacing them, this is also something that's a lot harder as you have to find the right integrated appliance to fit inside your cupboard. And what this does is really limit the amount of options that you have, which isn't really the best when you're looking for the best of the best in terms of performance. 
As I'm not a professional cook, integrated appliances for me are my preference, as I think that they strike the balance in terms of form and function. However, standalone appliances can also look fantastic and they are way easier to install and replace too, as they simply need to be slid into place and plugged in at the wall. But unfortunately, with standalone appliances, unlike with integrated appliances, which have these very strict constraints as to what you can fit inside of them, with a standalone appliance, you might be tempted to go for something that has all of the specs that you want, but it's just a hair too big for your setup. And you think, oh, it's only a few inches too big. It's not gonna be that big of a deal. And before you know it, you've got the appliance of your dreams that fits every single need you could possibly want, but it looks absolutely massive in your kitchen. Now, I have to say that I am usually all about function over form, even though I do think that the way something looks is very important. But when you have an appliance which is too big for your kitchen, this also isn't all that functional either, as it simply gets in the way and you're more likely to bump yourself on it or trip over it or just find it a little bit of a hassle to get around. And in my personal opinion, I think that choosing to do this can make a perfectly good looking kitchen look absolutely terrible. So considering that someone's put in all of this time to make a kitchen look a certain way, it doesn't really make sense to go and undo all of that hard work just because you want something like an ice cube machine on your fridge freezer. On top of this, an oversized appliance is just going to make everything else in your kitchen look a little bit small. And I don't think making your home look small is something that anyone wants. So my recommendation would be just to stick to the limitations of the space that you have for your appliances. And if there is a feature that you absolutely need to have, maybe consider a partial remodel where you can still space from other areas of your kitchen. However, if you're moving home and you already have an existing fridge freezer that you want to bring over to your new place and it is a little bit too big, of course, we are talking about a significant amount of savings when there isn't actually a need to upgrade. And really, at the end of the day, it's up to you whether or not your kitchen looking as good as it possibly should is of the utmost importance. Now, in your typical kitchen, you usually have two types of cabinets. You have your base cabinets, which your worktop sits on top of, and these are usually useful for heavier items as they're lower to the ground. So saucepans, small appliances, and baking, baking stuff. I don't bake. Baking stuff, like this. What's this? A whisk? A whisk. Anyway. And then you have your wall cabinets. Now these are wall hung and because they're closer to eye level, they're a little bit better for smaller items. So think things like mugs, glasses, maybe plates and bowls. However, these can also go in your base cabinets too. But my point here is that despite the tops of base cabinets and the bottom of wall cabinets being quite easy to access, it's a lot harder to get to their extremities at the floor and at the ceiling, where if you're short, it's quite difficult to access what's on top. So this is something that my wife struggles with and it means that pretty much everything in this kitchen needs to be on the lower shelves. And then when it comes to the base cabinets, you really don't wanna be getting down onto your hands and knees to reach something at the back which has made the backs of our base cabinets somewhat useless. And what's worse, if you have corner cabinets, these are even harder to get to. So when it comes to base cabinets, deep drawers are always the best option if you can afford them, as it means that you can easily access everything at the back. So because of this, I honestly believe that all base cabinets are just far better off with heavy duty deep drawers, as you can so easily access everything at the back of them. But as we mentioned earlier with cabinet doors, fitting cabinet drawers to existing base cabinets when you've already installed all of the hinges and doors can be quite expensive, which doesn't make them something cheap to do retrospectively. But with wall cabinets, there is something that you can do retrospectively, which is just as easy as installing them when they're brand new. And that is to add in pull down shelving, which essentially pulls the top shelf down to head height so that you can easily access whatever's up there. As even for me, it's pretty difficult to get to the back of that top shelf. However, this may be something that might be best reserved to smaller kitchens where space is at a premium, as all of these fixtures do cost quite a bit of money. But if you're short on space, considering how much square footage can cost in big cities, it might be worth the expense. 
Another item worth talking about is switch placement. Now, switches are incredibly important in the kitchen, as chances are you have several countertop appliances which are all going to need powering. So think things like kettles, coffee grinders, blenders, air fryers, mixers, and instant pots. And in a busy kitchen, it's not really all that useful if you're only limited to one space to put all of these things. So when it comes to switch placement, I always think that more is better, despite them not being the prettiest things to look at. Because of this, I think a lot of people fall into the trap of not specifying enough switches in their kitchen, which makes it quite difficult if you're cooking a meal and you need to be working in a certain area, but you can't because you've already stuck the air fryer there and there's nowhere else to put it. And unfortunately, because of this, this can tempt people to do things with wires that they probably shouldn't, like overloading single outlets and trailing wires across hot or wet surfaces. So when renovating or installing a brand new kitchen, I definitely think it's worthwhile having more outlets. And if the way that they look is of a concern to you, you can actually find some pretty decent looking ones which I think is definitely money well spent considering how often we're interacting with them. And you can also install them in handy places like the sides of kitchen islands or underneath wall cabinets, and you can even install pop-up outlets too. Now, of course, when it comes to kitchens, one of the biggest decisions is material choice. And when it comes to picking materials, you're usually picking something that excels in one of four areas, cost, durability, aesthetics, and sustainability. And pretty much any material you pick is going to fall somewhere on one of those spectrums. Now, for the sake of this video, I'm going to focus on four common materials that we tend to pick in our kitchens. That's wood, metal, stone, and high pressure laminate. Now I'm going to talk about metal first because this is the material of choice for commercial kitchens, which is the place where most of the world's best food is cooked. However, in a commercial kitchen, the main concern is with performance and not with aesthetics, which is why you don't tend to see metal used very often in a domestic setting. So really the use of metal excels in three areas, cost, sustainability, and durability, but not so much in the area of aesthetics. On the flip side, wood excels in aesthetics and sustainability. However, not so much in the realms of durability and cost, which is why we tend to see wood used more often in high-end domestic settings, where it's usually paired with stone, as stone is also very expensive, but also highly durable. And finally, the king of all these materials when it comes to most domestic settings is high pressure laminate, as this material simply gets you the most bang for your buck, as it's incredibly affordable, usually doesn't look all that bad, and it's pretty durable and sustainable too. But seeing as there are so many options in many of these material groups, really, aesthetics is something that is very subjective. And likewise, a material that's incredibly expensive may be quite reasonable somewhere else. And really, in my opinion, when it comes to picking the best materials for kitchens, it comes down to durability and how easy it is to clean, which is something that a lot of people tend to overlook. For example, white is an incredibly popular colour choice for kitchens, as it simply can make a space feel so much brighter. But one thing that people can quickly overlook is how quickly white can get dirty, and how easily it shows even the tiniest amount of dirt. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we don't want to be cleaning up every tiny speck of dirt from our kitchens 24-7. So picking materials that hide dirt better can be a more logical option. But worse still, when picking things like a backsplash, if you're choosing white tiles with white grout, because grout is porous, it's worth considering how this is going to absorb dirt over time. Another thing that I previously mentioned when it comes to cabinet fronts is that if you're going with a handleless system, it's worth considering how easily your cabinet fronts are going to show fingerprints. So for instance, glossy cabinets show fingerprints incredibly well, so I definitely avoid going for gloss if you're not using handles. And then satin cabinets like these ones tend to hide them okay unless your hands are very oily, whereas textured cabinets like these ones hide them the best. And although it can be tempting to think that we are incredibly clean when we first go out to design our kitchen, in reality, we all have those days where we're absolutely wiped, where cleaning our kitchen is the last thing we want to be doing. So when picking your color scheme or material palette, this is definitely something to bear in mind. 
But finally, I'll just end on a couple of quick notes that don't really require all that much of an explanation, which is inefficient workspace and terrible handle choice. Where for your work surfaces, you ideally want space either side of places like your sink and your stove, because these areas tend to have a lot of movement around them and you don't really want to be bumping your elbows into things or worse, burning the sides of a cabinet where building regulations even come into play when it comes to stoves. And when it comes to sinks, water can splash around quite a bit where you probably want to avoid getting it on your cabinets or your walls. And when it comes to handles, these can actually be quite hazardous if you pick the wrong ones as they are right at head height for small children and pets. And if you value your clothing too, some handles can be prone to snagging. However, this is something that I have covered in a previous video, so if you're interested in hearing more about that, you can check it out here. But just to conclude, I will say that all of this is just my personal opinion. And really, all that matters is that a kitchen is a space that encourages you to cook more, enjoy cooking more, and be a place that you can be proud of. But anyways, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.